This is a Shoah Foundation interview. The date is March 3rd, 2019. The interviewee is Honey Chester. My name's Joga Wurtz. We're in London in the United Kingdom and the language of the interview will be English. Good afternoon. This is a Shoah Foundation interview. The date is March 3rd, 2019. The interviewee is Honey Chester. My name's Joe Gewertz. We're in London in the United Kingdom and the language of the interview will be English. So to begin, can you tell us your full name, please? Honey Chester Vaughan Friedler. What was your first name when you were born? Um, my Hebrew name is Hannah, but... Um, I'm actually known as Honey, but when I came to this country, I didn't want the German, anything to do with Germany. So the first thing I did, I changed Honey to the English way, and it's been like that ever since. I, re I didn't even ever want to speak German, which I suppose is not particularly clever. Um, but my feelings for that country and its people, I can't describe to you. Of course, they enjoyed every minute when they could chastise us and hate us more and more. Um, we, it was really a very hard way of living. And so uh, eventually, I was, my sister, my younger sister, uh, got out of Germany first, she was the first one. Luckily she had a good education and she wanted to be a nurse. And they looked at her diploma and everything and they let her come over. And she was a very good nurse, very able. But of course she missed her people but that comes later. She was highly intelligent, and before the war, they worked them like slaves, every hospital. So on a day off, I think it was every 10 days, something like that, she just wanted to sleep, so we didn't have much conversation. They were exhausted, but better than being in Germany when all was said and done. You wouldn't have had a chance to speak like that there. Before we talk about your siblings and your early life in Germany, um, in general, yeah. How would how do you spell Hanni Friedler? Can you spell out your name the that German you were born way. with? Yes. Yeah. H A N N I Friedler F R I E D L E R. And where were that's, you born? That's, uh, that's, uh, where were you born? Um, where were you born? What town were you born in? Magdeburg. When they first came there from Poland, it was a nice town with nice amenities, no Nazis, but they soon changed that, didn't they? And, and yeah. what year were you born? It started with Hitler um, speaking to the nation, telling them the Jews must not remain on this earth. We will do everything we can to have pure Aryans. And that was a sign that we should leave. And my mother was all for going to Israel it's our homeland, and at least she wouldn't be chastised by Hitler. So she told my aunt, who lived opposite, it's a place called Breitowig, I mean, it's, it's a big, uh, um, it's like a big square. And she said to my aunt, we have to go to Israel because there's going to be a lot of trouble. No, she said, silly. So my mother said, you must 
realize we are in danger. All right, she said. I'll take myself to Israel and I'll suss it out and then we'll see. So she went to Israel. It was terrible. She insulted my family. She said, you live like pigs. Because in those days, you couldn't make an easy living in Israel. If every penny meant a lot. And people were glad to be there, not in Germany. So she had her way, she came back. And the first thing was announced that Jews have got to get out of this town. We don't want them, we have other means. Well, I knew what we knew what that meant. So my, we had affidavits, my father and mother, which somebody, a distant relation, provided. And we came, yeah. So she didn't have an affidavit. She couldn't get it. So she became hysterical. Of course, it was getting very near the punchline, if you know what I mean. So, but she couldn't get any help. So she was a bit sorry she didn't listen to my mother, obviously. And she went to another place called Theresienstadt, which of course she hated. She was used to the good life. And she was dealt with there. My parents were on their way to England. We had affidavits and they got on the train, went as far as Holland when the war broke out while they were in Holland. The Dutch at that time, probably still now, were very anti-Semitic. They said, you can't go to England, you're going to Germany, you're going back to Germany. And they were horror struck. So they went back to Germany, queued up, you've seen that on the films, haven't you? And they were separated. Men here, ladies there, starved out, that's the expression we use. And we had a Red Cross letter, um, which went to England, because I was on the kinder transport, Are you? I hope I made that clear, yeah? I didn't go with them. But the Dutch were wicked. They were coming to join us in England, in London. And the Dutch said, no, you can't. You're going where we're going to send you. They didn't even say where. And that was the beginning of the end. They were so cruel to them. They, they slept on bunkers. Yeah, that's fine. And they had a piece of bread, so they were lucky, and a drink of water. They lived like pigs. And they, they, that was, it went on for several days and then one day they said um, you're all going to have a shower. The shower consisted of gas coming down from the ceiling and killing them. It hurts me to say this to this day, I will never get over it. And so that was, there were no more Red Cross letters and they had a terrible death. I think people know about it. They used to pull their gold teeth out, which were very popular among the more prosperous people, I'd say. It was a status symbol. And so they went into this place, which was supposed to be a shower. I just repeat that. And it was gas coming down. And they died not so quickly. They were coughing and spluttering and sick and that was the end of them. Then they took them out to the fields and laid them down. They were already dead and one of the Nazis in charge thought it was very very funny because the gas made them they were lying down, 
but the gas made them sit up and they thought it was hilarious. They were already dead by that time. It's an awful story, but that's what happened. And somebody in England said, does that mean you don't like Germany? I said, it means exactly that. It was actually somebody's repair, not ours. I said, yes, that's what it means. I want to and talk. And from there, um, yeah, oh yeah, my elder sister and brother-in-law were on their way to Cuba. They had an affidavit for it. When they arrived in Cuba, they found their documents were not worthy of another look. So they sent them back. On the way back, one or two people committed suicide, jumped overboard. My sister and brother-in-law did not. And they begged Roosevelt, please let us enter your waters, please. And he said, no. You know, I can't do that. So then they went back on the St. Louis, shaken. And the next stop was Germany again. But they stopped in, for some reason, I don't really remember that, but I think it was Holland this time. And it wasn't very nice, but eventually, well, quite a long time later, they came the, um, uh, the, the jurisdiction, you know, the uh, people who interview you, and they couldn't speak English. And my elder sister luckily did speak English, very good English. So she was able to converse in their language. And because she spoke English, she made herself understood. They let her go to London, back to London, first on the boat and then by train. Yeah, we want to hear yes. everything you want to tell yeah. us. And they arrived, by tra they arrived by train and they were billeted out to some people in Dalston. And finally, it was Jewish. They were Jewish people. They didn't particularly like the refugees as Jews. And uh, the next morning, or well, the one after, they found there were little lice in the, uh, in the bed. So my sister told the landlady, oh, she said, we don't have that, you must have bought them, Jewish lady. So they got out of there, luckily, and went somewhere else. They didn't have lice, but they didn't have wonderful accommodation. And gradually, oh yes, I forgot one big thing. When they got back, they had to go to the Isle of Man. They were going to suss them out and leave them there for a while. That's, that was the way they treated them, but they weren't cruel. And so my sister got there and she was worried about me. I was only little. And she said, you must let me have my sister here. I'm very worried about her. She's very young. She's only 10, obviously. And I need her to be under my, my care. So she won the case and they went to the Isle of Man. Um, eventually, they were talking, yeah, they, they got some food, better than uh, they would have had in Cuba. So eventually, they were released, and they went to a place called, it was in Wandsworth, at South London. Okay? And, oh, they were so pleased to be, you know, more normal. They could eat, and they could talk about anything. And they, they encountered Wagner's great-great-granddaughter. 
nobody wanted to talk to her, you know, Wagner, synonymous with hating Jews. Isn't it? And, uh, but she, she, did, she didn't object, she, didn't, she just kept quiet. And they realized she probably was not a Nazi. My sister realized it. And so she said to her, can my sister, little sister, play the piano? There was a piano there. Could she be there? Oh yes, she said, please. So I still remember quite a bit because of the heavy music. So I played the Barker role. Well, we probably made one or two mistakes, but it came over okay. And then my sister went up to Wagner's great great granddaughter she said your sister little sister is a good musician you must see to it that she gets lessons and when you're released that was Wagner's just wonderful mm -hmm. also they got kosher food delivered from Barnet because they didn't let them go quite so quickly they had to be interviewed again you never know who smuggled themselves in you know but they got this um, kosher meat, they were very orthodox, and there were several others as well, orthodox, and Barnett sent meat, and my sister was able to cook it. So they had, not a terrible time, but they had to suss out whether they were genuine. And it took another week, but they were, and they found out. So they went into this boarding house, I think I mentioned that before. And at least they had a bed and a little bit of food. But of course, when she saw the lice, <laughs> can you imagine what she felt like? And she, she told the landlady, who was the owner, she said, you brought them with you, you know? We never have anything like that. So my sister contacted people, she knew who, and they, let her go from there and she went somewhere else which was more tolerable but that was a very nasty experience and a lot of these people went into what they call service domestic maids and i have to say from what i heard thank god we didn't have to go there the jewish some of the jewish people were really cruel to them this is something I'm not very proud of. Anyway, they got out of there, and gradually, my sister, younger sister, was she was able to see them. She didn't have a lot of time off, but she helped them to, because she spoke perfect English. She made abitur, you know what that means in that language, in Germany, when, when they were still allowed. So, it was, it was an improvement. And then my sister, the younger one, made some inquiries and they were settled into another place which didn't have lice. It wasn't exactly Hollywood, but they couldn't complain. And gradually they got into the way of life. They were able to rent a flat in Stamford Hill which was an improvement. My brother came just eight days before the war. He didn't want to leave my parents, but they made him. And they, they it wasn't luxury, but they could cook a bit. And my sister, Yeti, she was so knocked out, she used to come and sleep. That's all. She didn't have any more strength, you know. They used to work some like well, we, that's known, isn't it? Before the war, not because she was German. I mean, she, she had all the uh, right, um, I'm not calling ingredients, but you know, the right things that she learned and studied. So then they went to, um, yeah, I think the government found them something, a Moresby Road, which is Stoke Newington. And the life was a bit more normal. There were some Jewish neighbors who were quite amusing. Um, Before we talk about life in London, 
before we talk about once you arrived and life here. You want, I want me to, to talk about something else now? I, I want to start at the beginning and I want to think about your life as a young girl in Marderberg ah, in Germany. Yeah. Tell us, what year were you born? I went in 39. And originally I stayed with relations, but then I, became, then I got evacuated to Tunbridge Wells. I have actually moved around a lot. I have got some of it on paper, but we were glad to, to be looked after. But well, let's think about your early life in Marderberg. So I understand you were born in the 1920s. What year were you born? I was born in 1928. And so how old are you today? Now? Yes. Now I've lived longer than anybody else. Please God, others should. And I, I just said celebrated my 71st birthday. You mean, I think you mean your 91st? Yeah, yeah, well, I'm, yeah. well I live in a, in a flat. Uh, my daughter lives very near. My husband died when he was 89, that's a good few years ago now. And that was, uh, well, he was very ill. And um, I know he wanted to go, but he, he said to the others, I would love to die, but I don't like to leave Hanshin. They called me Hanshin, honey. He was that unselfish. And that's very, I found that very hard, very hard. Although he was a good age, he was 89. And gradually I had good schooling. In my, when I was 14, I went to, my brother paid for it. He wasn't particularly rich yet. Well, he was never so rich, but he wanted me to have a good education. So he applied for me to Pittman's College, where in those days they do different courses. So I had a commercial course and also a general one. That must have cost a lot of money. And, and I spoke quite good English already. Um, Can you tell us about your mother and father and what they were like? Well, I mentioned, didn't I, that they were living, they went into this prison and they were gassed. I didn't mention it. No, when it, um, yes, when they got off the train, after getting off at Berlin, the Nazis put them in, on trains and then they went queued up to uh, find somewhere where they found it to sleep. And they had these awful bunkers. You know, they were like hard as nails and there were nails there. And they had to sleep there and they got a piece of bread sometimes and some water. What was your father's <laughs> name? Abraham. What's your strongest memory of your father? What's your strongest memory of About your father? My father? Yes, I will tell you. A little bit amusing. We weren't supposed to go to any pic uh, cinema. But my girlfriend and I didn't perhaps think it was so important. And there was a Shirley Temple film on. And she, oh, she said, let's go. It's going to be dark in there. I said, oh, yes, I like Shirley Temple. So I went in and saw Shirley Temple. In the meantime, my parents were so worried, they were very mad. Of course, I didn't tell them what was going, nor did she tell her parents. Anyway, he sussed it out in his head. She must have gone to the pictures of the films with Irma. That's my, she's there on the picture, actually. And um, uh, that's what she's done. I'm going to have a look and see. So he went inside, he sort of mumbled something, and he found them. They could have been killed with a whole lot. And my father was no one for smacking or being very strict. But I had a slight, I mean slight, 
touch. He said, why did you do that? We were so worried. Oh, sorry. We did enjoy that, uh, that film. That was very naughty of us. But my auntie, we were very young. But we loved that film. And then we set the wheels in motion to emigrate. That's where we went. When they came off the boat, they went by train to the to Stuart Road. That's the name of the uh, where the uh, relations mm. lived, mm. and they were very nice to us. But then the war broke out, and it wasn't possible to stay there. So that my school, I didn't mention it. Did I? We had an elementary school. They were nice to me, actually. Um, they took me on and made a list of who wants to you know, go to this place or that place. And I stayed there for a while. I had very nice English, um, well, I don't know what to call them. They were like sort of mother and father sort of thing. I treated us well, the same as their own children. And I remember the road, it was called Tumbridge Road, uh, Helen Hampstead, Chipperfield Road, it was lovely there. So from there I went to Tumbridge Wells, uh, the Bloomsbury um, people, they arranged it for me. I, I wasn't the only, but there were quite a few there. And there was a piano there as well. So I stayed there for a while. I was allowed to write to my sister in uh, on the Isle of Man and she did her best to get me there so she could look after me, which she got permission and I went to the Isle of Man. Before we talk about your arrival, before we talk about your arrival, I still want to talk about I your young life in Germany. Yeah, well, I told you this with the dog, didn't I? Tell us, what was your mother's name? Frida. Oh, yeah, I will tell you this, if I may. I should have done that before. I, we had a teacher there taught arithmetic, and I was very young. I'd only just started school, I was six, I think. And he was writing on the blackboard with chalk, and he asked me to, to read it, and I couldn't got hold of my lapels and really hurt me. This man, he hated the Jews. Mm. And then we had another lady teacher. Her name was very apt, Fräulein Brunt. That means burning, Brunt. Yeah, we were quite pleased. I have actually got a picture of her, but you can imagine her. She looked like sort of nasty. She wasn't that bad, but not that good. Anyway, after that we went to, we managed to get into a, what they call a middle school, which was a little bit further, but I learned for a while, decently. But they wouldn't let us stay there very long, they chucked us out, the Nazis. And uh, we had a liberal synagogue. There wasn't that prejudice then, that there is today between Frum and Liberal. And they were very nice. We had a sort of a couple of classrooms and we could have lessons with this, this teacher. And funnily enough, well, it isn't funny actually, he didn't like the Ost student, you know what that means? No. From the East, the ones that came from power. He was a bit. But he suffered after that because they got him. Not that I wish it to him, but that's what happened. And we had, you know, some general education. And did I tell you about? Well, Tam where where did your family yeah. where did your family come from? Your grandparents were they German or where were they from? Um, they came, they left Poland to come to Germany because there was easier to make a good living. And do you have memories of your grandparents? Oh yes, I remember the business, they were wholesalers and people used to come and buy and it was all right until it stopped. Mm. And then they tried to get to England and uh, 
this cousin who who helped me get that to get to to them uh, guaranteed for them and they were let I don't know who let them go maybe it was the Germans because they only wanted to get rid of us but they preferred the gas chambers as you know because they were full of that was my childhood they showed it to us gold teeth they used to pull out all kinds of nasty things anyway that was yeah, my parents couldn't get out. So, I think I told you this, didn't I? Yes. As far as Holland. And the Dutch proved to be very anti-Semitic. They didn't try to help them or anything. So back to Germany they went. Auschwitz. So that was very, very sad. I could go on and on, but um, my childhood was happy in the early years, very happy. What's your strongest memory of your mother? My mother, I will show it to her. My strongest memory is she was a great educationist. She wanted everybody to have a good education, all the children. And those who would like to play the piano, she... I can't give you exactly the sequence, but this is what happened. She made sure we all had... That's why Yeti went was able to go to the London Jewish Hospital. If she hasn't had that education, it would have taken her. How would you describe your family's economic status when you were growing up? How would I describe...? Your family's economic status. Um, economically, you mean. Mm. They made a good living. They were charitable, and I do remember one thing, <laughs> I hope you, it's in order to say. A man came, I think it was from Poland, and he wanted some accommodation for a night or two. So they let him come Friday night with his Shabbat. And what I remember about him is he picked his teeth with our silver with our silver forks. I remember, I can't never forget it. I've still got those forks here. It was, it, it was like a canteen full of silver, yeah? We don't use it now, but um, we found it a bit amusing, I suppose. He wasn't perhaps so well educated, but he thought that's the right way to be. But they used the forks after it was um, thoroughly boiled in, <laughs> not oil and water. Well, that was that. Now, can I go back to something else which is quite interesting? Yes, of course. I can't exactly go to the... I ended up in, at one time, in Tunbridge Wells. And I think... And it wasn't bad. I was starving a bit, but we, we were all right. And... There was a girl there whose father was, I can't remember the name, composer. All right, she was nice enough. And there were teachers there trying to teach us. But one of the teachers probably didn't like us. And she was always preaching about how lucky we were to be able to get in and have food and, and teaching and all the rest of it. And she kept on and on about this sort of thing. So one day I followed her into the kitchen and I said, what do you expect from us? We are young kids, I didn't say kids, children. And we, we just came because somebody saved our lives. Why do you keep on at that? Oh, no, I don't mean that. No, 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 you got it wrong. Okay, so she didn't go. But this is the point. From there, I went to, uh, to the Isle of Man because my sister knew that I didn't, wasn't treated so nicely. So she got permission from the government, believe it or not, and I joined her there. And there was, they were poor. They used to have, um, they used to, for vegetables, they used to buy a Swede, <laughs> not a person, <laughs> it's a vegetable, and share it out among the people. It's horrible, really, but if you had not, they had very little food. Then came the time 
Well, oh, yes, and then they had permission to go and see their husbands on the Douglas, which is also a little, um, little town, I suppose, also on the Isle of Man, but this was Douglas, and they were allowed once a fortnight to see their husbands. So I was allowed to go, and we were all very happy to see each other, and after that, we went to the, yeah, it wasn't bad in the Isle of Man, they didn't really starve us, but we didn't, we didn't die from hunger. They were always Swedes, and if they had pocket money, they'd buy us some fruit. And from there we went to, which I think I might have told you, Wandsworth, which is South London. And they were sorting them out, and made quite sure that they're not enemy aliens or anything like that. But that's where I met, we met Wagner's great, great granddaughter. Nobody spoke to her because Gar Wagner is synonymous with anti Semitism, isn't it? So, and then after a while, we, she kept herself to herself and she seemed quite nice. So I thought maybe we made a mistake, I don't know. So she went over to her and she said, you are, your name is, surname is Wagner. She said, yes, but please don't, don't think of us as being the same Wagner's as those who are so anti-Semitic. We're not, we're not all like that. Please, I beg you, treat me normally. I would do anything to stop her, her uncle whatever he was doing it but she says at this moment in time I can't but if I'm ever released I will spread the word and her brother uh, came to Kinlos and she spoke please don't there was a Jewish uh, synagogue and we, you were allowed to go there if you wanted to pay a bit you know so we did and he spoke beautifully. Please don't judge us by my forebear. We are not like that. And this man went round the world, well, nearly all the, all the world, to explain that they are not cut from the same slice. Do you know? It is quite incredible that you knew the oh, descendants of Richard were, Wagner. Yes. But let's go back to childhood. Let's go back to childhood. Did yeah. you have a religious upbringing? We uh, were looked, you know, we were everything was had to be just so, and they had to prove that they were not enemy aliens, etc., etc. And somebody found us a flat, well, a couple of rooms, I suppose, in Stamford Hill, and that was quite amusing because. I'm not being nasty, but they were not all educated people. And they said some funny things. Um, Joe, get us a cup of tea with a biscuit on a plate. <laughs> and I was a kid then and I laughed at anything, you know. That's for, what is they meant to be kind. But eventually we were released. Our particulars were right and then um, my brother got a job and we had we rented a house near where we eventually bought one and my brother looked after my education he wasn't rich but he made sure I had a good education I think I've probably mentioned that to you more than once he sent me to Pittman's College where they had two courses um, commercial and and the other type where we learned not only bookkeeping and stuff but about history and all that sort of thing so that was very good and then we bought a house in uh, Anson Road which is a famous Jewish road and they worked their way up and my brother was very interested in getting me educated so he booked this these two courses for me in 
Bronsbury. And I was there about a year or two, and I did all right. And then he knew somebody, a friend, I think, who was, he wasn't working for the Zionist Federation, but he had a great interest free for his services. And my brother approached him, because he, he had got on well. He said, could you please get a, a post for my sister? She's had a very good education. We've always been Zionists. He said, I will see what I can do. Was this your first job? Yes. And what was it? What were you doing? Oh, just a minute. I had a short spell. Oh, God, yeah. No, no, sorry. I had a short spell working for the council, looking after people in new flats, <laughs> see how they went. And I was only, a, then I was 16. Uh, we want to report on it. So I got in the lift <coughs> and made notes. People weren't unhappy. They, it was a bit dirty. But anyway, I wrote a report and I didn't have to go there anymore. And then I, after that little job, that's when I entered um, Bronsbury and had a very, quite a hard course, but it got me the jobs I wanted. First of all, for people who were very poor and didn't know about cleanliness, but I didn't stay there very long. Then my brother knew somebody who had a, more than a job, who helped them at the Zions Federation. Oh, please get honey in there. Look, she, cause she said, uh, a shorthand course, a commercial course it is. She knows she's had a good inkling about English history. Could she try for, for her? I remember I often see the house where he lived. So I had an interview with somebody called Bakstensky. I don't know if you've ever known that name. He was the uh, Macher. And he gave me a test in shorthand, and I could do it, read it back, and he engaged me uh, as a secretary. Um, but yeah, yeah, I did all right. And and what was the what was the strongest memory of the work you did for the, the Zionist, Zionist Federation? Federation? Yes. Ah, now we're coming to the strongest I can remember, which was amazing because I spoke English quite well by then. Uh, Bekstensky interviewed me, yes, and I happy, um, I was happy to take it, I can tell you that much. And I'll try the sequence. Oh, yes. Then they called me, because I had a shorthand test with Bekstensky, he was the mother of the time. And they called me and they said, the secretary is ill, please will you stand in? I said, I'll try, but she can't come for perhaps a week. I said, all right then. And I did okay. But when I entered that room, the conference, who was there? Van Gurian, Rossetti, Levenberg, Sheraton, about six or seven of them. And I had to take dictations from this book English and I had a thrill. It was lovely. I felt I was really doing something. And they were very nice to me. What was it like meeting the first Prime Minister of Israel? Uh, that was Ben Gurion, wasn't yeah. it? What was that like? What was your impression of him? He was, he wanted nothing for himself, only good for the people. I can tell you that much. Yeah, I had to write shorthand and read it back to Ben Gurion. Not a long thing, but I think uh, some of it was sort of hidden. Um, they knew what to expect because they wanted to go to, or wanted everybody to go to Israel. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. And my auntie could have gone, but she said they lived like pigs. I told you that before. It just shows you when you're a snob, when one is a snob, it sometimes catches up with you. Before you came to England, when you were living in Marderburg with oh. your family, was your family religious? Yes. 
Did you attend synagogue as a little girl? No, it was called a shtibel. It wasn't a big synagogue, because it was an orthodox, but a very nice one. We used to be able to go in the yard and play. Um, my grandfather actually took all his money and had it made into an orthodox, it's called shtibel. Have you heard that expression before? No, no. It means it's a smaller one with an audience of people who are dedicated to their religion. Mm. Yeah. And uh, what were your hobbies? He never wanted anything for himself. Hmm? What were your hobbies when you were a young girl? What happened? What were I... your hobbies? Um, I already liked music very much. Uh, we had a near where we lived. There was a smallish opera house, and but by the time I. I I could have gone, I wasn't allowed, but it was a lovely, lovely opera. I think my family went there, but after that they didn't want any Jews. And, oh yeah, and one day I came back from school, and there they were all the Nazis on this occasion, waiting to go to this opera house. And I was only little and I was terrified. If they see I'm Jewish, they'll kill me. But I managed to smuggle my way out and we went to a place, we rent, they rented our flat called Knochenhauer Ufer. Yeah, I remember that, but they didn't stay there much longer. And then they rented this flat that I think I told you about. It was a nice one and, oh yes, we were quite happy there. They were left alone at that time. So one Friday night, Shabbat, they went across to that auntie, aunt, to, uh, to see if she's all right, because she, her husband had died. So I thought, it's already dark. We'll go and see young Tante Gusta. So they saw Tante Gusta, and in the meantime, the kitchen curtains caught fire because my mother wasn't careful enough. Can you imagine how I felt? There was a Nazi living opposite us in another also flat and he was a known a Nazi young fellow, must have been about 18, 17. I had to knock at his door and say, excuse me, there's a fire in my parents' flat. Could you please helped me to put it out and he did he ran, ran and took over I don't know some something to throw the water in that was horrendous but he couldn't refuse could he because he would have also gone on fire had a fire did he know you were a Jewish family I'm sure he did but the reason he did it he had to come in to extinguish the fire and the landladies who we used to have in Knochenau Ufer, you know, we rented that flat first. They were very nosy, they wanted to come and see where we, are, where we were living. They were quite friendly at that time when we were renting in Knochenau Ufer. So they came up, it was Friday night, my mother had the candles on, my father was in shul, and her and her sister came and sat on the settee. And I said, you know, I don't mean you, but the Jews are horrible. Did you experience lots of anti-Semitism when you were a girl? Do you remember anything, any specific incidents? Well, I think I mentioned one. Uh, when we lived in the Knochenau Ufer, there was a Nazi came well, towards where, where I was. He had an Alsatian dog, and I'm terrified of dogs. So I told the Alsatian dog to go for me. But he didn't let it go for too long. I don't know why, perhaps he thought he'd be, I don't know, that was my luck. He wanted that dog to kill me, I'm sure he did. And not an Alsatian, they're very dangerous, you know that. And if they bite you, they give you poison. I was terrified, but Somehow, somewhere, 
I was released from that, yeah. I've seen loads of things where we weren't allowed to go skiing. You know, um, there was like a mountain near where we lived, no Jews. Uh, I could write a book about it. Just ask me what's wrong. What did your parents do for work? They owned um, a business that sold to traders. Um, it was a good business at that time, yeah. And my mother helped as well. And it was in a place called Tischler Brücke. The, uh, the establishment was there. In Tischler Brücke, we knew uh, the people, uh, the, the husband and the young man who played the piano. And I went up with his sister. And it happened that he was playing the piano and he had to teach us to her, but he's world famous. Even now he's still alive. Must be an year or two older than me. But if he'd got found out, they managed to go to Israel. Mm. Mm. But now he's very often interviewed and I, I hear it on LBC. What, what, what is his name? Uh, he lived in Tischler Brücke. Max, Max was his first name. Pressler, P-R-E-S-S-L-E-R. And I went up, up there with this sister. She, um, she wanted me to come up for something or other. There he was with a teacher playing beautifully. And then my people got me a very nice teacher who was not anti-Semitic. She let us come as long as it was possible. If she'd been found out, she would have she would have gone to prison or something, yeah. So Those are my childhood memories. Mm. So your piano teacher in Marderberg was a non Jewish German. And shall I tell you about Kristallnacht? Please do. Yeah. Kristallnacht was horrendous. Um I didn't understand so much yet, but I came to understand it. My brother-in-law was friendly, well, not friendly. He knew this Nazi that if he greased his hand, he would help him to get what he wanted. And this friend of my brother-in-law phoned him and he said, Yiddish, she says. One word, Tylochen. They knew what it meant. What did that? What does that word mean? Skadoodle, hurry up, get out. So your brother-in-law uh, yeah, was Yiddish. warned by his German friend. Anyway, we went. Um, by that time, a customer of my brother-in-law knew what was going on. And he phoned and he says, come to me and look after you until this blows over. So my brother-in-law and my, his wife, my sister, my mother, my father, myself, got into his car. And what did we see, Christina? We saw them banging the windows, doing as much damage as possible. Luckily, they didn't sort of we were sort of terrified. If they'd seen us, we would have been, I would have got the glass, all of us. But it was very nice of their customer. He liked the Jewish people. So we stayed there overnight. And then he sussed it out to see if it's clear. But the roads were full, full of broken glass. If you were trod on it, you'd, you'd bleed. I can't tell you all flew. And I saw them doing the laughing. Oh, wonderful. Oh, you didn't do that one, window. Go on, do it. Yeah. That was my, not the beginning of my childhood, but uh, that's what I... What was, what, what was this like emotionally for you? What was my emotion? To see Kristallnacht. Terrible. We, were, we looked down. That's, we would have been shot instantly. And I understood it. It wasn't hard to understand. They were laughing and shh. And 
taking hammers and it was all over the place. And uh, well, luckily we got to the um, his flat and he gave us a cup of tea, uh, coffee, it was in those days, and said, don't worry, I will look after you as long as you want. So what? he did, but well, we weren't there long. And we set the wheels in motion about getting out of Germany, which, thanks to um, relations, uh, my mother's cousin urged her son to set the wheels in motion, which he did. When did and you? I've often been insulted. You, you, you do. You're filthy. We hate you. You want my childhood. That was it. Yeah. Dirty people. Oh, yeah, but a friend of mine, her, her daughter is actually on that picture. I think I might have mentioned it to you. She was taking shelter in a house. Oh, you know, on the outside. She, it was covered. I don't know. That. Perhaps they were flats. I don't really know. But it was pouring with rain. And she's taken shelter, and then it's this Nazi there. Ah, he said, you, you smell. Oh, she said, of garlic. So she said, yes, but it's very healthy. She was cheeky. Good for her. Let me shut up. This is part of my, my childhood. Did your family a have a radio at home? A radio? Mm. A what? A radio at yes. home. Did you hear Hitler speak? Um, I, I was more interested in the piano. Well, they, I think they were later on not allowed to have a radio. I think so. I think you hit, hit the nail there. They despised the Jewish people. Or they wanted to see them dead and get their money. What was the relationship like between the Jews in your town and the non-Jewish people? Before Hitler, it was okay. Before Hitler came on the scene, yeah. But he, he enticed them all the time, how awful we were. So, but I'll be honest with you, well, I might as well, as you're not alive. I, when I realised what was going on, I was quite a lot older. I, I didn't like my aunt. First she went to Israel to suss it out and she said they lived like pigs. And then this. You want my childhood, that's, it. that's how it was. When did, was you, when did you first understand that your parents wanted to send you on the kinder transport? The kinder, oh, my brother was, he was... He, he managed to get out, but he was on what they call Hasharah. And that means um, helping people to get out for while they still could. And then that was uh, shut down. And he applied the same people for an affidavit to get out of Germany. But uh, he, he, they didn't, he didn't want to go without them. And they said, we will go if you go first. So he, was, he came here, but he died young. Not from that, but something else. Tell us your brother and your sister's names. Alexander, Elsa, and Yeti. And is Alexander the eldest sibling? Yeah. So, did Alexander Sorry? did Alexander organise sending you on the kinder transport? And other children. He went to a different part of Germany and he, uh, he worked hard at it, but he didn't want to leave my parents. He could have gone, but he did in the end, because it was disper everything was different then. Not better, but he managed to get contacts and get some more children, not only me, others as well. Who of your siblings left Germany first? Yes, uh, Yeti. Yeti. Because she was educated and she could speak English, she became a nurse, London Jewish Hospital. 
How old was Yeti when she came to England? London? I think she was just 18, luckily. So how did you prepare for the journey for I came, leaving? I, oh yeah, I came by, yeah, the, the kinder transport. We went by train to a place called Bremen, where the ships used to anchor. And we were told to go on this one, they showed us. And my father came with me, by the way, to see me there get on a boat. And he stood there lonely, I remember that, waving and breaking his heart, I suppose. But they left it too late, they had evidence. Do you My remember? My childhood was very mixed. I was sensitive, I am not today. I think it's probably that. Do you remember saying goodbye to your mother? I don't think my mother could bear it. She did, but she wouldn't go to Bremen with my father because she, I, I, she would have, I don't, know, I don't know what she would have done. She actually saw it. She would have probably, she's a lovely lady. Were you able to say goodbye to your girlfriends, your school friends? Ah, well, the best girlfriend, when we had a lift through this friend that we could fill with different things, furniture, well, well not food, but linen, all kinds of things. I told you why, because he got them. And my friend came to see me and she said, honey, I'm emigrating to Belgium. I just came to say goodbye. Well, you know what happened in Belgium, the same. They were just as anti-Semitic. But she did get to England eventually. And, but she had a hard life. It wasn't easy. I mean, when you go to, they wanted me to go to school when I went to Stuart Road, it was called, in uh, Stamford, not Stamford Hill, Stokely, more or less the same. And so I, I thought, oh, well, that would be nice. But I couldn't speak in English. So and nobody realised I couldn't. So I thought, how am I going to... I went out of the school gates. I didn't know which way to go. I was really terrified. Not of Nazis, but where, where would I find them? Somebody took pity on me. And I did have a piece of paper with the address. And I gave it to him. He said, I'll see you home. An Englishman. Mm. So I went back and, yeah. When you I left, was terrified. When you left Germany on the kinder transport, did you bring any special belongings with you? Did I need special? Did you bring any special belongings with you? Any photographs? Well, I, I wasn't hope at that time. I was only little that they would follow me. I think they said they would, but then no, they couldn't, just to pacify me. And how old were you at the time? I was 10. Did, and then she... did you know anyone else on the kinder transport, any of the other children? There was, well, I met them, yeah. Well, there was a Dutch lady where we took refuge, so to speak. Do you remember I told you? Um, so when yeah. you left, when you left on the journey, did you expect that Elsa and Alex would join you later? I didn't expect. Well, I was hurt about Alex, but the others were supposed to land in Cuba which we learned much later. Mm. And the Roosevelt wouldn't let... They, they were faked um, documents for money. So they, they, there were quite a lot of people on board. Some took their lives. Several went and jumped overboard. And they asked Roosevelt, please let us in. Mm. They were getting near it. <laughs> he wouldn't. He was anti-Semitic, I suppose. What was your first impression on arriving, arriving in England? 
Our first impression? Your first impression when you arrived in England. Well, I found them pretty friendly. I, I mean, obviously, I, um, I couldn't speak English, but somebody used to take me in the morning. And so, yeah, and call for me each time after this experience. She was a bit older and she took it on. They weren't Nazis, thank God. Did you have someone waiting to meet you in England when you arrived? Uh, no, we were on a train. We came from, I think, uh, Bremen by train. And then we were sussed out and we went to my, uh, the one who g gave me shelter was waiting for me. And who was that? At the time, yeah. There were some nice people around. But can you imagine the shame of this le landlady, she was no lady, having a go of my sister and mother-in-law. <laughs> you bought the Lyceum, we've never had them. Did you have Not any Jewish family people. in England? Huh? Did you have any family in England? Well, yeah, they gave us the, um, the affidavits. And my sister, I might have mentioned it, Yeti, married the son of this lady. They were very happy. So what was his name? What was Yeti what like? was No, what was his name, your cousin? Well, then the war came shortly, didn't it? It started September, wasn't it? Yes, September 1939. Oh. I was evacuated. I think I mentioned that, did I? I was evacuated or billeted out. The lady was very nice and we weren't starved out. But then she couldn't for some reason. Perhaps she wasn't well, I didn't know. Then, I had to, then she got me somebody else who lived opposite. And uh, they said, yes, do come, it'd be nice. They got money from the government. I mean, they couldn't go to the Ritz with it, but uh, that was nice. And they were very, very careful with how much they ate. And when well, the war started, I was just glad to be there. Were you receiving any letters from family in Germany? In the beginning only from the Red Cross. And what did those letters say? They had to be careful what they said. Hope you're all right, see you. And when did the letters stop? Soon after. Must have been October, the beginning of, I think so. So when you were evacuated, once the war broke out, who were you living with? Were you with your schoolmates when you were evacuated to the countryside? No, I didn't. I was sent to Bournemouth. We had these same relations. And I went to school there. Uh, although my English was very poor, but they were very nice to me. He tried to teach me English. And of course the war, the war wasn't very good for anybody. Because the Germans were intent on killing as many as possible. What was your experience like learning to speak English? I forced myself to listen. I took a little while, but uh, I managed to speak enough to get me around. And then later on, then it came quicker. I wouldn't speak German. Of course, I would if they'd come over. Of course, they'd... oh yeah, my mother knew a little English. Mm. It was horrendous. And then the bombs started, and they went to Bournemouth to live, and took me with. And um, yeah, they used to come over, but we weren't hit, thank goodness. And, and I was allowed to share their house. They were very nice to me. And when were you reunited with your sister in England? Oh, pretty soon after I arrived. But she was always tired because they worked and I... But she, was, she always used to write to me and, you know, they didn't get much time off. 
That wasn't known in those days. Uh, now they do, they've got a union. And when were you reunited with Alex and Elsa? Where was I? When were you reunited with Alex and Elsa? Immediately after we was released. Oh yeah, they shared a house for a time. And yeah, they were, it wasn't long after that. Mm. Um, they had a little help from the refugee movement, German refugees, you know about that. They helped them to start off. And uh, we were quite fortunate that they came to the rescue. But what that Roosevelt did to uh, my sister and brother were very lucky that that they got to Holland at that time. Mm. I could write books about it. Anything else you want? What was your impression of life in England? Was it difficult for you when you were yes, a teenager? Thank God, yes. I did tell you about the time I went to the pictures, didn't I? I, I believe I've told you that one. I Cinema. think so. When you saw the Shirley Temple film? Yeah. Oh, that was horrendous. Very naughty. Mm. So, where were you when the war ended? London. It got less and less dangerous. And... And they, they, they bought a house because he had saved money. And they sent, well, they, during the war, they said, already, he already sent me to school on Bronsbury, Pittman's College. You're talking about your brother, aren't you, Alex? Who bought a house? Are you talking about yeah, Alex? Or rented it, but they paid for him. My brother made a big contribution to everything. Mm. But after that, my brother-in-law went into business and did very well. He was very clever at business. So at the end of the war, were you living with your brother and your sister? The end of the war, yeah. Uh, yeah. She, she got married soon after the end of the war and her husband was shipped back home. Hmm. And they were tremendous. Um, uh, when you were a child and you, you met... You get lost and you can't tell where you live. <laughs> but it turned out okay because some people are very lucky, uh, very nice, and we were lucky. They somehow found the place. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you meet Jewish people living in England? Oh, yes. And what was the Jewish community like? They were very favourable. They were nice. Ah, there were some exceptions. Some of them could only get to England if they had to be domestics, no other people would have them. Hmm. So my friend's mother was a domestic. I don't know what happened to Elsa. She wasn't that, thank God. And some of the English Jews weren't very nice. Perhaps they didn't want us there, I don't know. But on the whole, they were. And then they lifted themselves up and, you know, started working a bit and, and my brother continued to look after me, he made the wedding for me. Before yeah. we get to your wedding and your marriage, before we talk about that, um, when did you understand what had happened to European Jewry? Uh, and what happened in Germany? When did you when did you understand what had happened to European later, they Jews? They didn't want me to know. They knew I'd break my heart. Hmm. I, I didn't know a lot about it. I was very lucky that uh, they got me. Yeah. Hmm. And did who was it who talked to you about what happened to your parents? What what happened to who you? talked to you about what happened to your parents? Quite a bit later, because mm. I was only a kid. They, they knew it would break my heart, mm. but I didn't know, and I was only very young. But when I found out, oh, there were th thousands of them like that, thousands. They used to come by train, and they, they loved being the masters, these soldiers. So when they went on a train, and it was time to get off to go to. Auschwitz. 
terrible. I used to push them down the rail. The rails are. Of course, they weren't doing it quickly enough. Do you know what Can happened you? to your grandparents and your aunties and Same. uncles? The grandparents lived in Poland, uh, one lot, and the other one. I remember visiting her, I was getting a bit dicey. My mother took me to see them. But I think they said to them, don't stay here. I think they were one of the first to, to go here. Yeah. And they made it impossible for them to make a living. And my, I remember being going to a post office and sending some money. It was A little bit was allowed. And, uh, but that soon stopped, and they must have gone to, whether it's Auschwitz, I don't know. Mm. But they all had a terrible end, ending. Terrible. Mm. When I was very young, I didn't really understand it so well. I thought, well, maybe just an interim, and soon we'll all be united. So somebody said to me, who was it? Somebody in business. Does that mean you don't like Germans? I've told you this before, it amuses me. Does that mean you don't like Germans? I said, yes, it does mean that. And actually, I wasn't 100% right, because there are plenty of Ger not plenty, there were Germans who gave them shelter. I wouldn't say it was plenty, but there were one or two um, that piano teacher, if they'd known what she's doing, she said, oh, you come as long as you're allowed. I want you to be here. And she taught, yeah. Did you ever go back to your hometown or back to Germany as an adult? I could have gone for nothing. They would have paid it. Some people did. I'm not criticising them. I wouldn't. No. I could have had hotels, airfares, <clears throat> Free, <clears throat> no, thank you. But you've heard about the Stolpersteiner. No, what's that? They took, uh, oh, sorry, they, um, this artist who was horrified what happened made these stones and put the name of the um, people who rented it or who owned it on those stones. They should never be forgotten. But there must have been plenty who used to tread on them or spit on them. I wouldn't go back to Germany, not for anything. Mm. No. Some people did, if they could make a living. It's up to them. I mean, I shouldn't criticise. No. Did you ever speak German, the language, not after for you long moved time. here? Not for a long time. Then I said to myself, or they said it, you don't really fight a language. So what do to you is. Oh. So what language did you speak with your brother and your sisters? Oh, as soon we spoke just in English. They were quite intelligent and uh, they picked it up very quickly. So you were living here during the war and after the war. Did you ever have a bat mitzvah when you were 12, 13 no, years old? No, that wasn't uh, prevalent, no. Hmm. I don't think there were any then. Hmm. Things were very tough. Hmm. A bar mitzvah maybe, but you didn't have big parties or anything like that. What were your goals as a young person when you thought about the future? What were my goals? To... Yeah, I didn't dwell on it. To, to be educated up to a point. And uh, yeah, and to learn, and to study music. Mm. That was very much in my my mind. And you told me you played piano when you were a little girl. Did you then play piano as a teenager in England? Did you did you find a way to take up piano again in England? Oh yes, the piano came with us to England, number one. Um, 
And I did love the piano, yeah. And it's been restored to what I told you. It is absolutely just our new. And the man who came to tune it wouldn't, didn't want any money from Ben, but Ben wasn't having it. He was, he was honoured to play on that piano. Funny, isn't it? So Ben is your grandson, isn't he? Ben, who's Ben? Yeah, oh, something else I was going to say. Escape me. Well, I think I said this before. If she'd been found out teaching Jewish children, the piano, piano teacher, they, they would have all gone. Mm. She was dedicated to helping us. And if you, could, if you had a talent, she loved it. She was not a Nazi, that's for sure. Did you have piano lessons in London when you were a teenager? Oh, yes. I did not tell you. There was a lovely um, pianist during the war called Mara Hess. You might have heard of her. And she had a heart of gold. She used to give the workers free entertainment, uh, not charge anything for entering the, um, the theatre as it was then. It wasn't, as, that's what we called it. Um, she didn't want any money, she just wanted to give us pleasure. Of course, people, there were quite a few who were interested in classical music. And she used to give an hour of her lunch time so that she could, not far from here, I think. And did you also know the pianist Lisa Jura? Lisa Jura, the pianist? She was the, uh, she was the one that set it up. Mara Hesh, she became ever so famous. And that's the one where my brother had the nerve, I should say, to write to her and ask her, could she please teach my little sister? She loves the piano, so. And he wrote back, I'm sorry, I really haven't got time. I'd love to, but I will recommend you someone. That's when she recommended him and me to this piano teacher who emigrated to America, became very, very famous. So you're talking about Lisa, is that right? Yes. Oh. Lisa went to Hollywood. Mm. But unfortunately, she died young. Yeah. Lisa played and she got a scholarship from the academy. She went to, uh, she went to America. But later on, she got cancer and survived. But Did her daughter is the one we're in touch with. She likes to talk and to talk about the mother. You mentioned about your family's piano is now here. How did you get family belongings in England? How did you get your belongings from Germany? Oh, it stopped very soon. They only started it a bit from the Red Cross. It stopped. We didn't get it anymore. But the family piano was shipped to England, is that right? Some of them were, yeah. But it wasn't that easy. Because when you got there, you had to rely on the government. But they were pretty good. They didn't put them into the wrists or anything like that, obviously. But they, they took as many as they could. And they still do if people want, if people want to settle there. Mm. But I couldn't stand the climate. Mm. I don't like it very, very hot. Do you? you probably don't mind. I don't mind. So where did you live after the war? After the war ended, oh. where were you living? Uh, Anson Road. A nice road, plenty of Jewish people. And there was a synagogue there. Not exactly in well, the other end of Anson Road. Mm. Mm. How did you find integrating into British society? Uh, how did I manage it? How did you find integrating as a German woman into oh, I hated British society? It. Oh 
I used to sort of make excuses and say, oh, don't. But the grown ups said, don't worry, it's not your fault. I'm glad you're safe. But then we started going, being evacuated, and yeah, I've told you that bit. And were non Jewish English people, were they accepting to you? Yes, not everybody, but yeah. Those who accepted the school children were very nice to them. Most of them, they did get a little money, but it wasn't exactly, yeah, they were very, very nice. The one I was with, very nice indeed. Chifferfield Road, I remember the name of it. So the war ended, and then I understand soon after, yeah. how did you meet your spouse? Ah, that is quite a nice little story. As you know, I had piano lessons, and I wasn't bad at it, I suppose. And I joined the Zionist group as soon as I could, which was the other end of Anson Road. And they were very pleased to have me, obviously, as they were thinking of Israel and all that sort of thing. So I joined them, and one day, apparently my husband-to-be opened the door, and he heard me play the piano. And he thought, oh, this could be interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I uh, spoke to him and he took me out and then we got married. Yeah. And what was he his name? He the piano. What was his name? Reginald. In Yiddish, it's Reuben. But he, uh, yeah. What he was joined the Air Force, I told you, didn't I? What was Reginald's background? He, he, well, he felt it as a Jew to do his bit, and he joined up, volunteered. He, would have, he was very young when he did that. When he was on the list, I think he said he was 17. He felt it was his duty as a Jew to do something. And, uh, and they said... I'm not throwing off about him, I hope, but they sent him, he, they tested him on radar because he was very educated, and they said, we'll send you, wait till you hear from us. And not too long time afterwards, he had the invitation to join the Air Force, but they didn't say where, of course, it's a secret. And he just went. And his mother was, well, I mustn't say anything there. She wasn't too pleased. But lots of Jewish fellows and women as well volunteered. But he was very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about radar, which had just come into being not long. And I remember him saying they sent me to some godforsaken place. I can't remember where it's at. Oh yeah, the, everything broke down. It's a big noise that the uh, chief of the uh, sent for him, because they realized he was educated as in the form. He said, we want you to go to, I think it was Egypt to start. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, I'm not allowed to, but you'll soon catch on and you will be able to do it, which he did. But uh, he he wasn't amused because when he got there, everything was bro broken down. All the, the, the equipment, the wireless things that they you know where they talk to each other. And he said, "I can't do this." So I sent for the top, um, whatever he was, in the air force. He says, "You will do it. Otherwise, we send you to some horrible where it's yellow fever." Not that far from Egypt, and you know you don't survive there. But he never ever told me or anybody else how he got that, how he got there to the other, to safety, because he had to uh, write, what do I call it? He secrets. This was a secret, and he had to swear he would tell nobody how he did it. But when people asked him, after the war, he still didn't say, ah, oh, he said, oh yeah, there was a wren helping him, W-R-E-N. 
and after the war, even then, that's, if you sign the Secrets Act, you must never divulge. So he said, um, oh yeah, when people asked him, he did master it. That's why they sent him. But, um, what other ground? I lost my train. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, when people asked him, and then he came back, what did you do? Well, how did you manage to do this? You were not an electrician? Oh, he said it was only just a bulb. It really had to. We were not allowed to divulge anything. You can understand that there were plenty of, what you call them, spies, spies. around, weren't there? So where was Reggie from? Where did Reggie come from? Uh, him, my husband or them? Reggie, your husband? My husband joined... Was he from London? Oh, yes. But he also used to, when he came back, there was Mosley, wasn't there? The Jew hater. He tried to kill a few Jews. He used to speak in Hyde Park in those days, after the war. And a lot of Jewish fellows went, and they were going to... I don't know what they're going to do. And he went as well. But um, he didn't use it. He had a razor with him. Because these boys, they didn't fight for nothing, did they? They wanted their pound of flesh. And he was such an anti Have you heard of him? I have. Terrible anti semite Dreadful. He wasn't the only one. But they wouldn't let him get away with it. Did you ever hear Oswald Mosley speak? So did I. Did you ever hear Oswald Mosley speak? What happened? You no, know? Mosley, did you hear him speak? Oh, after the war he was busy. In Hyde Park that was, yeah. Preaching about the Jews, yes. How did it make you feel that there was this threat of fascism in your new country. What could we do? We weren't going to go back to Germany or anything. And the government kept a bit of an eye on it. A bit of an eye on it. And towards the end, I think he was... I'm not sure if he went to prison as possible. But if he'd done anything bad, they would have all got together, the, the Jewish boys. They would. They would have killed him. Do you think there was ever a risk in Britain for fascism to become strong? I don't quite get your point, yeah. Do, do I ever think? Do you, do you think there was ever a risk in Britain of fascism rising oh, up? Oh, yes. But the, the Mosley a lot of... That was fascism. And they used to have uh, meetings in Hyde Park, the fascists. And a lot of the Jewish young... Youngish fellows used to go and uh, interrupt his speeches. And I'm sure he went as well. I don't know whether he told me or not, but I know he did. They felt it their duty. They didn't fight for nothing. Was Reggie quite political? Oh, he was political. He joined the political party. Yeah, and so did I. I was, I was conservative before him. I won't bore you with how it happened. I think I told you anyway. No, we were, we're very interested to hear. So were you, were you and Reggie members of the Conservative Party? Uh, tell us about, I was tell us about Reggie's well, politics. He, originally, he was a Labour person that voted Labour and didn't last long. And... I put my point to him that the Labour are going to have all the Jews sent somewhere. Well, he knew. Anyway, he did his duty and created this, uh, well, it was like meeting places, but not to talk about Mosley. And also, I have to say, that uh, the government were pretty good to a lot of these people who previously didn't have very nice homes. Um, and they thought they'd better it for them. And I have to admit, 
I'm not really that proud of it, but I had a, a job to interview these people. Didn't last, there wasn't Hammersmith. And when I saw what a hectic, you know what that means? No. What a mess they made of new beautiful buildings, lovely lifts, everything spanking new. And I suppose that was a bit of a... I don't mean revolting I was, but I think I was uh, very disturbed. I had to interview them. And you know the joke about coals in the bath? They used to, some of them used to do it. But I never actually saw coals. They used to have coals to light fires. Didn't have central heating, many people. And I thought they'd given them everything, guest cookers. And they don't care, they just, I don't want to say what they did in the lift. And that put me off labour. I'm sorry. So and did you also vote? the labour people who, who preached. But that was a, that was quite something, because my husband originally was definitely labour. He felt that Jewish people needed labour, not half, they didn't. The Conservatives were nicer at that time than the labour. Why do you support the Conservative Party? Because I think they're more open-minded. They don't talk a lot of rubbish. They are educated people. They know their history. They follow what's going on in the world. And they're usually, I'm not everyone. I mean, I'm not that daft, but I've met a lot. I've been to a lot of meetings. And my husband spoke at one. And it was actually quite funny. He had a sense of humor. I went to this, like a dinner, that didn't even have kosher if they wanted it. And he said, um, oh, well, he had to speak. He was the chairman of his, um, like a big part of Northwest London. So he said, well, I see Mr. Thatcher's methods are working. Nearly all my friends go bust. <laughs> so everybody laughed, that was funny. Of course, he did tighten up and people did suffer, but she had to do something to get the country up again on her feet. But that was funny, everybody had a laugh, even if they didn't appreciate it, I think they did. Was and Reggie a local Conservative Party chairman? He changed then to the Conservative. I might have been part, he was very clever and he knew what's what, but I might have had a little influence I said, Are you join those horrible fascists? <laughs> but he, uh, then he became an ardent concern. They did a lot for them. Mm. Well, he was the chairman, but they all loved that joke. Of course, she was always tightening up, but she had to. You can't live on a few pence. You've got to work for it. Mm. It was quite amusing, I suppose, but they didn't like it. <laughs> when and did you and Reggie get married? Uh, 49, I think. And did you have children? Yeah, Pamela. When did you have Pamela? Uh, after a few years. And Pamela is also conservative. She used to work, I don't mean she worked them, she used to knock at doors and so on. And my son in law was also very young when he married. And he, he, at one time, they supported Labour, but not, not for very long, after the Chesters. So before we had a break, you were telling us about your politics and you were telling us about Reggie. Where did you get married? Where did you get married to Reggie? Me? In a synagogue called War Lane. Was it a big event? Well, a bit modest in those days. They hadn't long been back from the war. Uh, but it was big enough and people seemed to enjoy it. So then you had Pamela, as you told us, your no, daughter. she came after, that seems to run the family, she came after seven years. But very welcome. Is she there? And does Pamela have children? Yes. Ben? Jerry and Jessica. Is Jessica here? I think she might be. I think we'll meet her in a little bit. 
So thinking about your life in Britain, when did you become a British citizen? Oh, ages ago, as soon as it was allowed. And doubly, because I got my own British citizenship, and also um, my husband's <laughs> and the government involved, yeah. How did and you I, feel? I loved being a citizen. Not like in Germany where you were hated. Did you ever experience any discrimination in Britain? No, thank God I didn't, no. Did you ever receive any, or seek out, any counselling for what you had been through? Well, a cow, did you say? No, did you ever seek out counselling? Oh, okay. Therapy or counselling for what you had been through? Uh, I, I used to go to council meetings and I think I told you my husband was the chairman uh, of the Finchley, the East Finchley one. But did you ever speak to a counsellor? Oh, like yes, a, no, like all a the therapist? time. Yes, yes. Said, yeah, oh, yes. They, they, I told them what I thought, mm. but not in a nasty way. Mm. So they did forgive me. They're not all angels, we know that. How did your uh, level of religious belief was it, was it different when you were an adult compared to when you were growing up? Yes, I think there's more feeling for religion now than hitherto. I feel that is true, yeah. Mm. I'm not saying about everybody, but uh, this is definitely a fact. Do you believe in God? Yes. Sometimes I ask, why? I never get an answer, of course. I wouldn't like to say I never, never doubt things, because I do. It's only natural. But on the whole, I was brought up very, very in a religious setting. And maybe I'm not as religious as could be, but I'll do my best. Always will. And I have great respect for people who keep it not for show, but from the heart. Show doesn't interest me. How often do you think about your early life in Germany? How often oh, do you think often. of it? I think about Auschwitz a lot, what happened to them. And I haven't been able to, I could go, but I don't think I could bring myself to do that. Some contemporaries have done it. But, uh, but I do love Britain. However bad things are, still better than other countries. So far, I'm not going to say forever. <clears throat> do you ever have dreams or nightmares? Yes. What do you think about the state of Israel? I love Israel. May they be blessed forevermore. Not everyone is perfect, you can't, but their hearts are in the right place. I mean, there are obviously one or two people who we wish wouldn't be in power. I'm sort of uh, quite down to that. Though. But on the whole, I think they've been marvellous, what they've made of that country. And they've gained a lot of respect from the nice non-Jews. And may that continue forevermore. Have you had positive relationships with non-Jews in your life? Uh, relationships with what? Positive relationships with non-Jews. Um, if you mean like marriage, I don't know, never had anything like that. But I do speak to them or when I worked, I mean... And friendships? Well, not deep friendships. But I used to go to something called Tai Chi, and they were nice. There were Jewish people there as well, but unfortunately, the instructor had a heart attack with all that 
are people laughing, but it's terrible. With all that exercise, you can't teach anymore. And I did like him, he was Jewish, and very dedicated he was, but unfortunately, you think that if you have a loss of exercise, you, you know, you survive, but, uh, but I mean, I have uh, neighbors, perhaps they're not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're bosom friends, but I do speak to them. As long as I know they're not in Semitic. And I haven't encountered that, thank goodness, not in hand in any way, on a personal level. If they did, they'd heal from me. What do you think about refugees in the world today? What do I think about What do you think Jews? about refugees? I think the Jews are more aware than hitherto. There are some that we could do without. But um, funnily enough, American Jews, who they always detested, I don't know why, by a lot of people, they do a lot, and they still do, money-wise. I think you misheard me. I, I, I'm saying, what do you think about refugees? Like you were. You were a refugee. Oh, yes, of course. And yeah. what do you think about refugees in the world today? Well, I don't like all of them. But all the Jewish ones I do. I don't mind admitting it. Because we've had a rough time. And it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But I think they're good people. They're generous. Uh, the, the British Jews, not even the very um, rich ones, give plenty. Mm. Their hearts are in the right place. I, I love England. Of course, I'm remembering when I first came and I was made welcome. And I wish they should prosper. Why did you come forward to share your story today? Why did I come share it? Why have you shared your story? Because I was invited to do so. And I thought it's a good idea. Hear myself declaring the right, what I feel. And I've done that, I think. I think you know what I feel about conservatives, religion. Mm. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to add before we finish? To ask you? No, anything else you want to tell us about your experience, your life? My experiences are mixed, very mixed. I've had some rotten ones, which I try not to dwell on. But on the whole, I haven't. I mean, they did, just after the war, a lot of people, you know, it was mostly. And he was, my husband went as well with a razor. Lots of young people went. But on the whole, I believe this is a, as good a country as is possible. And I mustn't talk about refugees, because we were that as well. But there's a lot to be said for this country still. Not so much, I'm saying it again, on the left, but generally speaking, it's still the best, a good country. Finally, is there anything you want to say to future generations who might listen to this? Oh, yes. Um, be good citizens, try and try harder to keep your religion and be uh, helpful if you can, if you have the health, I mean, you know, and, and it's a lovely country, just hate to see it go down by certain sections. And it's probably jealousy, that's always a part of nasty things, jealousy. They're jealous of the Jews because they make money, but they wouldn't try and make some for themselves. They go and beg for it. From the... That's my feeling on it. I should always be grateful to this country. Not every... As I said before, not everything is perfect, but they've treated the um, German, possibly other countries, Jews, pretty well.
have helped them and I'm very grateful. Okay, well honey, it's been a great pleasure to hear Socialism your story today. Socialism is not my cup of tea. Hmm. And I've just given you one example which stays with me. What they do with lovely new flats and, you know, I mean, that, that have had an impact because I used to have, I had a little, a job, an orphan little, where I had to write my opinions. I didn't say the coals are in the bathroom, I said they're in the lounge. Anything else that you want to add? Well, on the whole, I have strong feelings for this country because Balfour, Churchill, without them we wouldn't have an Israel. You know that's true. And that has a big impact. We've got some very good um, politicians in Israel. I told you I've, I've, done, I've written shorthand for all of them. Mm -hmm. And on the whole, I don't find they are... Maybe there was one who was a bit irregular. But on the whole, the, except for Nathaniel, I, I know my niece is there. They all hate him. I think he's had his day, yeah? Or his wife has. But that doesn't really interest me, so it's the quality of life they've got to try and improve and care for people. And of course that needs a lot of money. But Jewish people are on the whole quite generous, mm. I would say. Okay, well we're going to speak to your family soon, but for now, thank you very much. Cameras rolling. Honey, when did you find out what happened to your family members who couldn't leave Germany? That was after the war. I was young, they tried to spare me as long as I could. But then, then I overheard, so I realised anyway. Yeah. So what did you find out? I found out that they subjected them to a terrible lot of cruelty and they made they laughed when that Nazi I told you about thought it was so funny remember I told you that and where were your what happened to your parents my parents died in Auschwitz mm. I've never been to see it I, I don't think I can I couldn't do it I couldn't but at the same time I could have had a free uh, holiday, luxurious one, for nothing. Could have gone, uh, gone to Magdeburg and lived it up. No. And I don't believe those Stolfestein are doing any good, because those who hate the Jews probably spit on them. It's my contention. I know somebody told me they do. What In the happened? First World War, they said a good German is a dead German. Don't know if that's right or exaggerated, but I think there's a lot of truth in that. Because they're very arrogant about their country and uh, all kinds of things. They said this was coined during the First World War. A good German is a dead German. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. What happened to your wider family members? What happened to... What happened to Fam more distant family members? You had aunties and uncles and grandparents. Well, we haven't got a lot of distant ones anymore here. Well, we've got relations in Israel and they've got plenty of their own worries, as you know, with them being bombed, etc., etc., on buses. And I wish that could be eliminated. But I think they, they're not, it's not quite so prevalent as it used to be, from what I gather from the press. And what was the fate for your gra for your grandparents? What do I feel what, for them? What became of your grandparents? Well, they, they, I've been to Poland. Did I tell you? No. Yeah, when I was very young, my mother. And they were still, no, they were already anti-Jewish then. 
But I think that's prevalent in Poland. Those countries are always like that, I think. Mm. Romania, to mention but one. Yes. I said the fact is, on the whole, Jews are not the most favoured nation. And it's mitigated by jealousy. Because they make a lot from little. That's my opinion. What happened to your paternal grandparents? Your father's parents? Well, they took my grandfather away. But I think I might... I don't know if I mentioned it. He was not a well man. He had a stick. Supported himself on the stick. He was going into the... Um, train. He didn't look back. He was brave and he knew what would happen to him. And I admired him very much the way he held himself up. But most of the Germans loved to see the Jews hanged or killed or whatever. Yeah. And I believe that element still exists there. They've always been. I'm sure it does. And I don't know how people can go back there and live there. Well, I suppose it's Parnassus. See, a lot of Israeli Jews went to Israel and had a very poor time because they didn't have any money or uh, no prospects. So I don't really want to condemn them. That wouldn't be very nice. But I, I, if they, well, I suppose if they gave me a million pounds, I'd give it to charity. I wouldn't refuse it. Not everyone, not all of it, but to give her. I don't want anything from the Germans. My last question is what happened to your maternal grandparents? To who? Your maternal grandparents, your mother's parents. The shame as all of them. They were slapped away and murdered. Do you know where? Yeah, I know somebody who lived nearby. He had a connection with a Polish person who was pro-Jewish and saved his silver till after the war and gave it back to him. There are some good ones, but very few and far between. But I know this man. He, we, we looked him up and he says, I'll give you all your silver back. That was a Pole. You know, they have been famous or infamous. Uh, with with uh, anti-Semitism much before the Germans. But I suppose there were people there who did have a not a bad life, and I know some of them made a living, but it didn't last. But the Germans are very cruel. This thing with a dog, I mean, I was terrified. This is, I often think of it, and he was grinning, he thought it was funny, the Nazi. Rolling. Honey, tell us who we've got here. Can you introduce the family to us? This is Pamela. She's my daughter, my only daughter. She's very, very religious, very sincere, and an amazing person. I could say more about it, but uh, I think she may not like it. <clears throat> And this is, well, who's Pam? This is the genius lawyer who is modest. She amazes me. Well, it's very, very good natured. Got lovely children. This is the baby of that trio who is lovely and helpful. There's nothing she wouldn't do, not only for me, for anybody. She's everybody's darling. Well, the minute she opened her eyes after being born, that's a fact. And this one, ah, oh, is Jerry still here? Jerry, ah, oh, yes. These two brothers are very close, very, very kind, and never a nasty word about anybody except Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me begin with you, Pamela. Yes. What age were you, or when was the first time you remember understanding your mother's history and where she had come from and, and what she had been through? Yes, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. 
nothing was ever everything was oblique there were little snippets here and there whispers in german and occasionally english and those were the ones that i managed to scramble together and at the age of seven i realized that there had been a terrible man hitler in germany where my mother was born and i learned that and i knew that so many jews including our own family had perished but that, that my mother somehow came on a train to England on her own so that's when I p sort of pieced it all together at the age of seven it was very frightening and I remember thinking where can you get a cyanide pill so that if this nasty man comes to England you can just end it in one go so I think I must have heard about the Nuremberg trials to have learnt about a cyanide pill. Mm -hmm. So, I, because one of them obviously killed themselves mm -hmm. that way. So yeah, that was about the age of seven. Mm -hmm. And do you have any memory of your parents talking to you about what had happened to your maternal grandparents? No, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's something you, you just came to understand gradually? Yes. Yes, very gradually, as I say, snippets here and there, whispered conversations. Did you ever hear your mother speaking German? Did she ever teach you any German? She didn't speak German uh, or teach me any German. She would use it if there was no common language, say, for relative came from Israel. In Israel, I have used it, haven't I? Yeah. Um, but she didn't stop me learning German at school, because it was the second language after French. Um, but she didn't really help me or, you know, anything. It was just something, an academic subject that I did like geography. Mm. So, no. Okay, I'm going to open up to, to the grandchildren. Joey, when do you feel that you were told or became conscious of your grandmother's history? For me it was a very gradual process so I never really um, have a specific point in time as a child where I really remember any of these stories being said. Um, it was something that whenever uh, around the table it would kind of come up I think that Granny would uh, not really be too willing to discuss it. I think it was, it was quite painful and there was also just a, a common feeling among the family. We all knew that we don't really talk about these things. Uh, and somehow, just over time, I just ended up knowing these things almost kind of from snippets here and there and almost against everyone's will. I just somehow would have found these out. And it was only really in very recent years that... Um, we started to discuss these things much more openly and um, and it's and it's just recently become much more of a thing. I think um, one of the things that may have helped is the introduction of some new people to the family. So a few of us have got, we've, we've all got married. My wife has a, a background in Holocaust studies, so my grandmother was always very willing to kind of open up to her, but also meeting new people for the first time. It wasn't kind of expected that you just kind of knew, but we don't talk about it because obviously new people don't just know. So it was only then that I really almost kind of came to learn stories that I knew, but I didn't know, kind of for the first time. Mm. Same question, Ben. Um, again, sort of, again, very oblique and um, sort of spoken of in whispers um, frequently, I would say, but never explicitly. So I think it was kind of always there. And then I remember vividly once, um, I think I was also about the age of seven, that conversation happening a tiny bit more directly than before. And I just remember Granny, Granny's face and eyes. Um, and as a little boy, kind of maybe just old enough to engage with that conversation on, on some level, I, I still remember the feeling and, and, and that this was so, so real, that these things that... that whether I knew exactly what had happened or I didn't, but the feeling of it is, is still, I think now at the age of 32, I think that feeling as a seven-year-old boy is, is with me. Mm. Shortly after that very experience, 
um, not for the first time, but again for the first time maybe um, on a personal level to, to kind of understand it. We went on a family holiday to Israel and I sort of understood it a little bit more through that. I think my parents maybe, again, not very explicitly, but I think we kind of spoke about the significance of, of having Israel as Jewish people um, and the kind of, I think also again only on the level of a very little child, but I kind of, in some sense, from then onwards, understood that that, that feeling that Granny was expressing and that was so dramatic for me to see, here in this country, you know, we were walking around as tourists in Israel, that, that sort of wouldn't happen to Jewish people. And that, that, that thought kind of crystallised in, in my head around about then. Mm. I mean, Jessica, same question to you of, of when you sort of understood your grandmother's history and what had happened. And also, was it a strange experience that presumably this coincided with learning about World War II, the Holocaust, kinder transport at school, I'm guessing? So I think I actually have a slightly different um, scenario to my brothers, perhaps because I'm the youngest and maybe over the years it was talked about a bit more. But I really don't have any sort of time that I can pinpoint to suddenly realising about. I always knew about it and um, for as long as I can remember, it's just been a part of our family history and something that I've always known about. I, I actually remember... I think probably also about the age of seven, um, someone of my age asking when the name came up, who was Hitler? And I was shocked. I, I, you don't know who Hitler was? Um, you know, a, a Jewish girl my age. And um, so it's definitely always been something that I was aware of. Um, I. Yes, there were elements of it was difficult to talk about, especially for Granny. Um, but I definitely also did the second part of your question. I did learn about the Holocaust and and the war um, in school from a young age and connected from the beginning, connected the two, um, especially as Granny's husband, our granddad, fought in the Second World War. I always knew about that. That was always as well, part of the family history. So this is sort of a question that I, I'd be interested to know everyone's answer, but Pamela, I mean, did this understanding and this history affect your relationship with your mother in, in any way? Mm, that's a bit interesting question. I don't actually think so, because I was very lucky in that because it was so oblique, I wasn't so badly affected as many second generation children were. I wasn't told, oh, it's terrible to waste food because we starved, there was none of that. I had a totally beautiful childhood, probably overcompensating for what happened to my mother and also my father who lost his father at an early age. So I can't say it affected my upbringing in, in any unpleasant way. Probably the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, no, it was totally lovely and charming. Okay. And I feel very lucky because I understand it wasn't like that for every second generation and some of them were quite mucked up themselves. Mm -hmm. And I went to a meeting once of second and even third <coughs> generation and I thought, oh, get me out of here. These people are acting like they actually went through it and they didn't, so get over it. But actually, perhaps their experiences were very different to mine. So it sounds like what you're saying is it did affect your relationship, but not in that classical and negative way. Yeah, I suppose so. And I think that resonates for me as well. And probably it relates to the first question we were being asked, because I think in our... In the last 70 years of our family history there's a bit of a pattern of everyone kind of protecting everyone else mm -hmm. from it and Jessica maybe you would have you might have heard a lot from us mm, and because probably. we were children ourselves and we didn't protect you yeah. do you know what I mean or, or I, I know my mother said that your cousins knew more about it than you and you were an only child so I think maybe 
all the adults in the room at any one time were desperately trying to protect the children from this, mm. whereas maybe some younger siblings or younger cousins didn't get that from, from other children in the room, and then you kind of got initiated into it and were old enough to kind of learn that then you didn't speak about it. Mm. And I think that's probably affected not just our um, discussion and, and, and view of the Holocaust, but also our entire family relationships. I think that in general... Um, we're, we're, we're a very close family and, and like you say everybody's trying to protect each other and everybody's really looking out for each other I think the fact that Granny and our family's been through so many things has kind of um, made us push for kind of more togetherness and, and, and more, uh, more love on each other and that's never been an explicit thing but actually thinking about it although it was never said I think that was very much in the background. And I think, again, more recently, when things have come out, I remember um, recently my, my granny hugging my, um, my baby daughter and saying, oh, you're, you're such a beautiful child. You're going to please go have such a wonderful life, not like the children who were murdered. And I, although that's not something that would have been said in the past, I think that that's been a very strong feeling. It's so important to show the love for the people that we have because of what, what we lost. Mm. Anything to add in, in terms of, has it impacted your relationship with your grandma? I think um, it's impacted my relationship in that I, I grew up as a child, I always, I thought that I was lucky to have her because she was always such a wonderful granny. Um, along with with granddad I was so lucky to have these grandparents and I knew that it was it was luck because if if granny hadn't come here on the kinder transport then I well I wouldn't be here but I certainly wouldn't have her as a as a grandmother so okay how does it feel for your mother to have given testimony today oh, I'm, I'm very pleased I'm amazed um, it's been a long time coming, <laughs> but now it's happened and it's all in the open. I think it, it's a it's a good thing because there are people who really don't understand, and they should understand. And this will be part of helping to them to understand. And I just feel so grateful to my German grandparents who took that. It's so difficult and brave decision to let her go on the kinder transport, without which none of us would be here today. Mm -hmm. And finally, to the three of you, is there anything you want to say to your grandma now? Just thank you, and we love you, and, <laughs> you know, I... I'm not sure I'm worth it. Some of us have... <laughs> I'll, some, are, I'll worth somebody it. else here. I think the really thank... You know, as Mummy's alluded to, thank you for, for giving the testimony because some of us have started our own families and, and it's, you know, very important to me that in at the right time, perhaps our own children will be able to, to watch that and know and for generations to come. Yeah, thank you, Granny. We're so proud of you. Huh? We love you so much. Oh, I'm not sure I will. Bless you. Yeah, we love you. Thank you. Okay. Very brave of you. Very yeah. brave. Sorry. Okay. Well, we appreciate you all being involved today as well. So, uh, one final time, thank you and thank you very much, honey, for taking part. So this is my grandmother's diary, which um, you can see that she kept um, from when she uh, was brought over to England. Um, and she's written in German. She was 10 when she started, uh, because you can see that the first entry is from January 1938. Um, and as it goes on to um, 
October 1939, for example, um, it kind of leapt out of the page for me because she's actually underlined some of it where she writes, it was a zer zer, a very, very um, traumatic parting from uh, mummy and daddy. Um, and I saw this diary for the first time only a few years ago, probably around about 2010 maybe at the earliest um, and you can see it's in good condition still uh, but the another line which just leapt out for me at that time actually granny then read it read it to me in German where she says I haven't heard from my parents for such a long time I I realize now that I'll, I'll probably never hear from them again Super. Right. I'm just wrong again. Mm. Oh, just, sorry. sorry. Just for safety. Yeah. Can you just point at it again? The yeah, line. Okay. The line. Yeah. And yeah. Just say it again. All right. Doesn't matter. Just, doesn't matter about that. Okay. Yeah. Just got a copy of the line. So it was a very very traumatic parting from mummy and puppy. Thank you, Ashley. Could you? Honey, let's start with this picture over here. What's this a photo of? Which one? This one. Oh, it wasn't. That's my... You saw that sorry family one over there, didn't you? That's Eva. Mm hmm That's... That's... They all say, that's me. Mm hmm I mustn't touch them, you see. That's the same one again, but small. That's... That's on the cocktail cabinet, yeah. Shouldn't touch it, you said, didn't you? And these are very old friends, I believe. Yeah, that's my father in uniform, isn't it? They called him up and he went. And that's the thanks. I mustn't do I But he was lovely. Who's this in this photo? Yeah, and this one is our Alex. What's he doing there, reading a paper? Okay. I, I, you don't want me to touch you, do you? He was very, very, he gave lots of speeches. and. So this is your brother, Alex, is that right? This one, yes, yes. And oh, is this, this looks like you and your husband? Friends. No, not my husband there. These are just friends. Oh, yeah, is, is that right, Jay? I think it is, actually. I couldn't, I've got my go. May I just... Mm -hmm. I just want to sure. explain to you who Let's have a look. Oh, I've got another one, Uncle Ali. That's mother. She was a good looking woman. They, it was fashionable to be stout in those days. <laughs> but she was lovely. This is, where's the villain? Oh, I shouldn't say that. Tante Gusta. They live like pigs. That's her husband. That's my brother. Who else? Have I missed anybody else? My father in uniform? Yeah, if you wanted to. Okay. Should we do that with pointing at it? No. Let's, let's cut for a minute. Okay. I'm wondering if we... Okay. So, honey, can you tell us who's in this picture? So we start here. Who's this? Oh, yeah, Lily Wiesner. That's one of her over there. She is her mother who answered the Nazi. I'm leaving that in her car. It's garlic is healthy. And who's this? This one. This one. Oh, that's me, isn't it? And this is Irma, her school pal. Uh, where's Lily? I know that was Lily just now. Me, Irma. Uh, oh yes, that's her name is Senta. It's a German name. And on the end? Oh, that's Eva. Eva. Okay. Isna. Okay. So, can you tell us what you, what happened to your school friends? 
they once uh, there was one sister who went to Israel and I think she lived a long life but she Auschwitz that's honey yeah is that me that's you yeah and that's Irma she lived in Magdeburg and this one poor thing she always used to copy you with <laughs> we used to have dressmakers in those days yeah and what's this one here it's a tree isn't it did you say Evie uh, Eva her name was Eva E-V-A yeah what happened to Eva yeah We were a nice crowd before Hitler, well, even after, after the point. Didn't quite see you coming. My mother did. Can I start? Okay, honey, so who is that a photo of and when was it taken? Can I have a photo? Can I? <laughs> ah, this was taken in Israel. He, um, he went to Israel on a holiday and he seemed to fall in love with this girl. So he came back and he went back again, but then he fell out of them. <laughs> that was our, you know the story, and he didn't marry her. So that he is never your married. brother. I think it has, might have had something to do with me because he looked after me, hook, line, and centre, financially and everything else. I think so paid for the uh, college, piano lessons. <laughs> and the funny thing is, he wrote Myra Hess. She was very, very famous uh, during the war and after. And he wrote and wanted her to come to, to me and to teach me piano. Were you very was, close with your brother, Alex? I was the young. He was 14 years older than me. He was wonderful to me. I was cut. Okay, honey, who's in this photo? Believe it or not, there's me and Reggie. Where was this taken? At the seaside. He was a great swimmer. You're a very handsome couple. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. We were married then, yeah. So, honey, who's in this photo? I mustn't touch it, must I? Who's this? Mother? Mm. Is Uncle Ali on there? No, I can't see. That's Gusta. May yeah. I touch it? Oh, yeah, that's that, um, my father's in law or something, yeah. And in the middle? My brother, Ali, Alexander. And who's this? That's my. F that one we just had, isn't it? Is that my father? Yeah. That, sorry, has he got a little moustache? I think so, that's my father, yeah. And my mother, yeah. She was also always into education for the children. Mm. Okay. Okay, so honey, this is one of your wedding photos, isn't it? And who have we got in this picture? Who are some of the people in the photo? Yeah. I'll start here. This is Elsa and Zelma. This, you know, is me. And that's my husband. I don't know who this one is. His face isn't quite... Oh, that's Ali, isn't it? I don't know. And who's this? This one? Mm-hmm. Is that your sister? Yes. Yeah. And is this your cousin Sam? That, that, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, 
Yeah, you know who that is. Yeah, it's a lovely photo. And this is, yeah, and this is Evil. You would know who Evie is, Evie's father. And he was quite jolly then sometimes, but he had a very black outlook. Oh yeah, he had an accident on a motorcycle, that's what happened. So the story goes, that made him, I knew he said that word, I didn't mean to. But it made him, <clears throat> not the usual type. <laughs> okay. Okay, super.